on Facebook. And so it looks like that's happening right now. And uh, we're going to be recording this webinar today because uh, we want to make sure that it gets available and exposed to as many people as we possibly can. And so welcome everybody as, as more and more of you continue to join. It's great to see some familiar faces. Uh, please do hop in the chat window and let us know who you are. Uh, you could type your credit card number in there. No, don't bother <laughs> doing that. Uh, just let us know who you are uh, and where you're from, just because it's always great to hear from folks. So I can see Heather there, and she's from Manville, Alberta, uh, which is great. Hi, Heather. Good to see you. Uh, I can see Cynthia there from Calgary and Arlene from uh, Saskatoon. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, Greg from Calgary. Welcome, Greg. And uh, Allison from Kamloops. Awesome. Great to see you. And Deanna uh, Lawson Langford from uh, Hamilton, Rod. So you know her, right? Absolutely. And uh, Karina from Calgary. Great to see you. And uh, Jill uh, Bowen from uh, Calgary as well. So folks, uh, you know, just as you're comfortable, get on uh, into the chat and let us know who you are and where you're from, and Cynthia will be with us to do uh, a little bit of engagement as well, you know, just because uh, of the fact that we love to stay engaged and hear your questions and hear your comments as we're going, and I'll certainly do my best to reflect those to Rod. Uh, we've got Bonnie Lindsay on Facebook, and she's saying hello. <laughs> of course, we know Bonnie, and we got Joy from Calgary. So anyways, today, welcome. Uh, you know, it's May the 14th, and I'm really honored today to have Rod McDonald with us, the CEO of the Certified Coaches Federation. Um, you know, the whole focus around uh, this webinar is to talk about business resilience. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we are in a situation right now, COVID-19, where we've, we've all had to, um, you know, either shift uh, or not. And, uh, you know, I think if, if, we, if we choose not to shift, uh, you know, we may not be able to execute our business plans uh, at all because things in the world have shifted so much. But, you know, if, if we allow ourselves to become somewhat resilient and somewhat agile in this time, I think that there's opportunities, right? And, and that's the key, right? So many times we don't control the environment, uh, but we have some control over our response. And so why not lean in learn as much as you can and grow. And so I'm really excited about that. Uh, and I'm going to be interviewing Rod, but before we do that, uh, I always love to start with the lighter side. Uh, some of you know that about me. And, and I think there's even a scientific reason for this. You know that uh, increased stress actually decreases your immune response. And apparently this thing called COVID-19 impacts our immune response, doesn't it? And so I think anything we can do to boost our immune system, you know, eat your fruits and vegetables, drink lots of water, make sure you're working out, but also make sure you're, you're, you're enjoying some humor from time to time. So I've got a couple of memes for you. <laughs> I like this one. Uh, if you're a person who remembers back to the future, that's uh, probably my era and yours, eh, Rod? And, <laughs> there you go, right? You go, Michael J. Fox back in the day. And uh, Marty, whatever happens, don't ever go to 2020. And I think that describes a lot of people's 2020 so far. Hi, Terry from Edmonton. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, you know, COVID has also changed relationships, you know. <laughs> I mean, obviously, when people have relationships um, with the whole physical distancing it's often through a pane of glass or, uh, you know, six feet. You can see folks gathering in parking lots and, and their lawn chairs and they're all, you know, six to 15 feet away. Uh, you know, it's also changed hygiene. And I love this, you know, so much focus on hand washing. Well, what about your feet? You know, what about the rest of your body? And uh, so hopefully you're showering, right? And, and, and cleaning the whole thing. I think that's important. The whole thing being your body, right? Um, you know, and <laughs> I really like this one because some people, you know, they, they went to this restaurant called The Kitchen, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and, and in the kitchen, you have to gather all the ingredients and make your own meal, uh, you know, and, and I, I have no clue. Uh, this gal says how this place is still in business. And that's been so cool to see people getting back in the kitchen. I don't know if you've noticed that, Rod, you know, but baking and, and cooking and trying new recipes, you know, have you seen a little bit of that? I have. And in fact, my wife who doesn't do, I, I'm pretty sure she's not listening to this, but uh, you know, she doesn't do a lot of the, the baking and, and cooking and stuff. So there's been more baking 
since COVID-19. And when I first walked into the kitchen, I saw her doing that. I said, um, who are you and what have you done with my wife? <laughs> That's right. I mean, what else are you going to do, right? And uh, might as well. And I've actually, it's amazing, you know, all the work I've been doing in mental health, so many people have said it's been quite therapeutic for them to get into the kitchen and try new things. And uh, hey, whatever works, right? Especially in a time where we're physically distant. Um, you know, here, here's my last little meme today. Uh, they are starting to reopen in some parts of the country, barber shops and things like that. And uh, so, you know, when your barber coughs, and I'm sure if you're getting your hair cut, that's what's going to be happening, right? But, um, you know, Amy here on, uh, on the chat says, I love my kitchen. It's my new favorite restaurant and the reviews are going up. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Amy. And so, you know, um, you know, COVID-19 has, has changed our world. We don't know uh, what that's going to look like a year from today. Uh, none of us predicted where we'd be today uh, a year ago uh, from this day. Um, and so people have said, you know, what's the solution? And uh, you know, I don't know if there is a solution. I, 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 I you know, I, I think it's, it's a, a work in progress, right? But uh, hey, Nita from uh, Marathorpe, nice to see you. Um, but I think, you know, at least part of the solution, it's always in conversations, right? Learning from others, getting different perspectives. And so that's what we've been doing uh, for the last, uh, this is, I think, our 10th episode now. I mean, as soon as kind of the lockdown started, I think actually the week before, uh, we started this webinar and we've been really leaning into learning from different business experts, not folks on TV, talking heads, but actual folks who are in the trenches. Some of them are online uh, businesses and some of them are offline. So today, uh, you know, our special guest is uh, Rod McDonald and uh, you can see his uh, uh, bio on the screen. He's the CEO of the Certified Coaches Federation. He's uh, had over 30 years uh, in the field of wellness and self-improvement. And so he's a leading authority on personal and professional change. He's worked both with for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. And, uh, you know, as you can tell, he's spoken in lots of places all over the world. And uh, he's also an author. Uh, he's a proud husband. He's a father. And so, you know, it's great to have uh, Rod with us here today. So welcome, Rod. Welcome to Business Resilience Now. Thank you, Abe. I really appreciate the invitation, and I just want to give you a shout out for, for doing this. You know, the, this is a great example of somebody, uh, yourself, who's already been a leader, who stepped up even more to create the, this webinar series and to, to bring people together and, and share um, good messages and good best practices, and I, I applaud you for that, so thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I do appreciate that. And so, you know, Rod, you know, I always like to just open by giving folks a chance just to share, you know, your story. Like, you know, we'll, we'll leave the bio up for probably just another minute or so. And then we'll top, stop the screen sharing so that people can see more of you. Uh, but, you know, tell us, you know, just your, a little bit of your journey. Like, how did you get where you are today? And that's going to be really helpful to us in understanding where we're going from here. Sure. Well, you know, what's, what I find really interesting, because I do some of these interviews as well, and when I get to talk to whether it be coaching clients or other peers and colleagues, speakers, authors, you know, whoever it might be, everybody has a unique story. Nobody's story is the same as anybody else's. And, um, you know, from a humble perspective, I would say that I have a pretty boring uh, story in terms of the, the things that I've, uh, I've gone through or, or had to get through and so on. But uh, I was born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and um, from parents who, my mom was actually from Saskatchewan, so uh, towards your neck of the woods there. And um, my dad uh, was from Scotland, actually. He, he came from Scotland uh, as a police officer and actually moved to Edmonton and uh, was a police officer in Edmonton for, uh, for a while before he retired from that and became a private detective. And um, so, and then they moved to Montreal just before Expo 67, I guess it was, and uh, had my brother and then myself after that. And uh, it was really interesting because neither of my parents spoke French. Uh, so uh, it was a real struggle for my brother and I to, uh, to learn the language. Right. And uh, we went to French immersion schools, and he certainly uh, had the academic genes because he had he, he did better with it than I did. But um, that was that was certainly the formative years of my life, where 
I made all of my best friends and uh, went to high school and, and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the interesting things that, that I discovered from uh, early on was that uh, whenever I worked in a job, if I found that there was something that needed to be done, um, I would often put up my hand and, and offer to do it. And then I, off, and then I found, and this is no surprise for people who've had this experience either, but I, I found that as I did that, um, that was appreciated by the owner or operator, manager, whatever, and it created new opportunities. And subsequent to that, I, I recognized that when I saw a need for something that wasn't being taken care of, uh, if I created the solution for it, and this goes back to the to the solutions sort of concept that you're talking about for, for COVID-19, if there's a solution to be had, if somebody can create it, then um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. So there was many times in my career where I created jobs for myself by pointing out a need and then saying, hey, you know, we really need to do that. Why don't I do it? And uh, created opportunities. So I was very fortunate to have many of those things happen in my life. I think that's so cool. And I mean, you know, and, and I think a lot of the time people are waiting around for an opportunity to come to them. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the other uh, option is to create something out of what you've got and maybe even enhance it. And, and it sounds like that's what you've been doing. Yeah, for the most part. That's great. So tell me, uh, in terms of your, your business experience now, and, you know, have you seen anything like COVID? I mean, 30 years in business and, uh, you know, is this the, is this kind of the worst you've seen it or the most challenging and, 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 and what are some of the things you're hearing as you're out there talking to business owners and people who are entrepreneurs? You know, I, I think that, uh, for the most part, I think everyone would probably agree that, that this is, actually unprecedented. We, we sometimes throw that word around um, lightly, but, but truly this is unprecedented. We've never uh, in our lifetimes, maybe you'd have to go back to the Great Depression or maybe wartime or something like that to see something even close to this. Um, but this is, this is so unprecedented that, no, I haven't ever seen anything like this um, on this scale. The closest I, I would have seen that would be um, on, on a very small scale, back in 2003, uh, the blackout that, that sort of hit most of sort of the Northeastern United States and uh, Southeastern Canada, um, I was running a conference on that weekend when the power went out, and that's, that's a whole other story. But, uh, and then back in 1990, I think it would have been around 93 or something when there was an ice storm in Quebec. I was still living in Quebec at that time. And everything was shut down for about five or six days. Yeah. But that's five or six days. And we've been in this for eight weeks or whatever it is. And, and um, nobody, I think, could have uh, expected things to be like this. And, you know, on the one hand, um, I, I have described this a little bit like the fact that Canada, um, I guess, in a good way, hasn't had very many what I call fire drills. You know, when we grew up, uh, most kids who grew up in Canada, the U.S., or, you know, in developed countries, uh, they have fire drills uh, at school. So usually once a month or something, the bell will ring, and then the kids have to gather, and they have to go to whatever the uh, gathering point is outside the school or in the gymnasium and whatnot. And the reason we used to do that was so that when things did go badly, if they ever did, hopefully they didn't, uh, we wouldn't have to think about what to do. We just did it. Yeah. And in Canada, fortunately, we haven't had very many natural disasters or uh, virus outbreaks or other types of things, you know, no real war conflict for the last 170 years or whatever it is. Um, and so we're not used to having to react in Canada um, like many other countries do. And so we weren't ready for this. We were far from ready for this, for, uh, for this. And so I think that that, th I really hope that this is the wake up call for us as a country to uh, get ready for whatever the next thing is, because there will be something else down the road. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing we're sure of probably in this, right? Is that it's, it's, it might even be a, a precursor to even more challenges. So what, what, what's some, what's some of the stuff that you, 
you think can help, you know, people in business right now. And, and, you know, I mean, for me, that sort of represents everything from the, the gig economy and people who have a side hustle uh, all the way to those who own and run their own business to, to career professionals. I mean, what are some of the things that, that you think can help get folks through this? Well, you know, you mentioned uh, the immune system earlier, and I think that we can use that uh, both physiologically as an example, but also psychologically, you know, what's our psychological immune system like? What is our financial immune system like? And, and the notion that, you know, are we ready to defend against an invader, whether it's real or imagined, quantifiable or not? Um, and how do, we, how do we deal with that? So I would say uh, as two generalizations, and we can certainly dig deeper into this, would be that for employers, so owners of businesses, uh, I would say that there's a certain, this is the wake up call to say, well, you know, is your business, does your business have an immune system to respond to something that's going to upset it going forward? And sadly, many businesses will not make it through this crisis. Um, they, just, they just didn't have the immune system in place. But I think there's an opportunity to, to prepare for that. And in general, it, it looks like you know, having a certain amount of savings in place to carry you through, having uh, ways to adapt to different environments, um, and whether that's an online environment or as it relates to restaurants to do takeout and delivery um, in these kinds of situations. For the employees uh, and anyone who is, you know, self-employed and not able to rely on somebody else, um, for sure. I mean, I guess for employees, you have a sense that you can rely on things, but this will be the wake up call to say, maybe you can't rely on your job or your boss because you may be laid off. And fortunately we haven't seen that happen all that often across the board. I think we have seen examples of that. So I think that uh, we can encourage people to build up that financial immune system, that psychological immune system. Uh, and I think that was apparent when we saw early on in the first, say, three weeks or so that people just didn't know what to do. There was the hoarding of toilet paper and, and sanitizing wipes and all kinds of things because people actually regressed into a state of uh, self-preservation. <clears throat> and, and it manifested in, in a hoarding of toilet paper, which it's funny in hindsight, but in that moment, there were people who were actually panicked, not knowing how they would clean themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think that there's a, a really big opportunity to do that. Now, I'm gonna say one more thing and, and I'll let you jump into this because this, the, the sad thing that I'm gonna predict is that unfortunately, I don't think most businesses and most individuals will actually boost their psychological, financial and business immune system. It's a little bit like, you know, we hear stories, we used to hear stories all the time, every Christmas, every New Year's, some family loses their life tragically because they didn't have batteries in their smoke detectors. And I think that that's, that's a sample of the fact that people can do things to protect themselves um, and they often don't. And so I hope, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will, but uh, human nature suggests that many people won't put those measures into place going forward. That's a great observation, and I and I, I like the idea of uh, you know understanding it through the lens of of psychological resilience because you know for some folks you know it it is you know really clear that 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 there is no business alternative for them but to shut down right even with all of the billions in government support or whatever because COVID in my view has been a great exposer right of and and, and I I don't mean that in a negative way but. But, you know, the problems you bring into COVID are only amplified through COVID. Yep. Um, and so, you know, if, if your business wasn't sustainable, then, and then, it, then COVID may uh, only reveal that, you know. And, and that's not a criticism. I've, I've shut businesses down before. Uh, I, I think one of the hard parts is, is, the, is more the psychological side. It's, it's the grieving. It's letting go. So, so maybe speak to that a little bit. I mean, you know, how can somebody... You know, I mean, what if my business is sustainable, but I don't have the psychological resilience to get through because I'm so discouraged or I feel so lonely or so isolated? I mean, how can people equip themselves with psychological resilience in this time? 
Well, I think that there's, uh, there's a few different things. Uh, and ironically, some of them seem to be a bit of a chicken and egg or cart and horse sort of scenario that, you know, if we're, if we're feeling psychologically resilient um, and we have that psychological immune system, maybe we'll make better choices. But the making of better choices also helps support that psychological resilience. So I think things like uh, good nutrition, sleep, physical activity, uh, and a support network uh, are absolutely critical to it. I think that there are people who, if they ate poorly before, they probably ate more of the not so, not so good foods uh, under stress. If they didn't sleep before, they probably slept less. Um, you know, and if you didn't have a support network, that was definitely revealed because uh, in many cases, people were even more isolated and disconnected. And, and there's a real cost to that because we are a species that, uh, that craves for connection. And in spite of the people that might, might say otherwise, I think that we all know that um, we actually do rely on each other and it might be extended uh, reliance in the sense of you know, the food chain of food being delivered to a grocery store and relying on those people, the farmers and the truck drivers and so on. But it's also the, the, the need to know that in a time of crisis, is there somebody that can help, whether it's just to show up or to check in uh, or to lend a hand or whatever the case may be. So what has been the biggest challenge for you personally through COVID? I mean, and, and you know, you don't, you don't have to go into big detail, but what, ha what ha have you experienced through this? Because I know I've had my own sort of uh, moments of self-awareness and, and even struggle uh, in spite of the fact that I, I do webinars like this and probably appear to be pretty, um, you know, happy-go-lucky. The truth is, you know, COVID has shaken me in a few areas. And, and I, I, think it'd be I think it would be, I think I find it helpful to hear, you know, other folks' journey and what's been happening with them. So how about you? Yeah, you know, I appreciate the question. And, and the truth is that I think that, um, you know, you and I do some similar things as speaking and writing and coaching. And uh, I think that that gives us one of the unintended um, benefits of doing that kind of work is that we get to hear so many stories from other people about their struggles and overcoming those struggles. And so we actually uh, become this sort of receptacle for all these strategies and we may not even consciously be aware of it, but they sort of seep into us. And, and sometimes I think that those show up for us in times of need. Uh, having said that, uh, early on in, in this situation, probably, you know, two or three weeks in, um, there was a point where uh, I, my anxiety level did go up. And, and that's, that's quite unusual for me because I'm, I'm, I'm not an anxious person. Um, you know, if you look at any of my personality profile stuff or Ayurvedic doshas and all the different things that, that help to describe someone or understand someone, suggests that I'm more of the, you know, sort of grounded, slower thinking, slower acting, but dependable and all that stuff, which is nice. Um, but in this particular situation, my anxiety spiked. Mm -hmm. And I was aware of it at the time. And <clears throat> the, the, I realized why, why it was, which was, uh, I think like you as well, I'm, I'm an information junkie. I, I, I want to know, I want to understand, I want to, um, I, I want the information, the, the data, the statistics, the research, anything I can get my hands on. And so I was pouring over a lot of information early on in this, watching a lot of news, watching a lot of press conferences. And I realized that my anxiety level, you know, the, the, the uh, rise in anxiety was kind of parallel to the, to the amount of information that I was taking in. Yeah. And so uh, when I realized that, and I realized that with that, and I'll just say that it, it did affect me negatively in the sense that I was more uh, reactive around my family, a um, little bit snippier, you know, however you might put it. And, um, and then I realized what was happening. And so I just decided I'm, I'm only going to check the news once a day. I'm only going to, you know, read the different research and things like that, maybe twice a week. And when I pulled back on all of that stuff, it made a huge difference. And I just love that. I mean, and I actually I found the same thing, right? That, uh, you know, before COVID, I mean, literally since I was like 20, 
I subscribe to three national newspapers a day and, and I'm just, I just, it, it's, it's a, it's a part of actually typically how I de-stress because, you know, you just read what's going on and, and, uh, it gives me a chance to get out of my situation and think about something else. And, uh, you know, the relentless barrage of, of sort of negativity. And it's not that the reporting of facts is, I, I deem as negative. As a matter of fact, I don't. But, you know, there are other things going on on planet Earth right now besides COVID. And there's a heck of a lot more who have recovered than who have died. But, of course, you know, the media has uh, incentivized, uh, you know, itself somewhat around negativity. So I like the discipline that you describe, right, to recognize, hey, um, you know, I'm, I am getting anxious. Uh, doesn't mean I'm, I'm a weak person. That, that's what happens when, you know, the, the messaging is consistently, uh, you know, negative. And, uh, and so, so how do you find the balance then between keeping informed? Because, you know, we, we got to do that. You're, you're a husband, you're a leader, you're a father, you want to uh, be uh, informed, but not uh, inundated, you know, how, how, how do you do that? Because that's important. <clears throat> Well, you know, on the healthy side of things, I think it is important for us to be curious and to be seekers of information okay. uh, and to be both self-aware, which is, I think, probably the most critical, um, you know, attribute that we can try to uh, improve, but then also be aware of what's going on around us. So w when we have that curiosity and when we are seekers of information, um, the danger is how much we allow in. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I, I think that the, the key uh, is to make a decision. You know, how much uh, are you trying to acquire? How much are you gonna, going to allow in and put a cap on it? And that's, that's what I did because, and this actually, it, ironically, this relates to what you and I do because we both teach the, the level one certified coach practitioner course for the Certified Coaches Federation. And in that, we teach them about cognitive reflex conditioning. Uh, and and how it's a great tool to sort of in a moment where things are not going the way that you want them to go to to realize what is what's happening what's actually happening and then um, to to recognize you know how we're processing it and then to make a decision what do we actually want and there were a few of those moments where I was anxious and more snippy with my wife in particular and I realized that's not who I wanted to be or after the fact, I realized it's not who I wanted to be. It wasn't helping uh, our relationship, wasn't helping the energy in the, in the home. And so it, it took a little time for me to process that. But then I realized what was happening and dialed back the information gathering and things got better. And I think that's something that, that definitely, you know, people listening to this, watching this uh, can, can at least uh, contemplate, you know, and consider, uh, you know, what are they allowing in? And how is that affecting? How is that affecting what's going out in terms of their words and mood and energy? That's great. I mean, it's really good. The uh, you know, and, and my wife, there's a good chance she might be watching this or or you know, ch tune into the recording. But it's actually true that when there's a problem between us, like 90% of the time, it's me. I don't know if that's the case for you. Um, you know, and 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 that's not to say she's perfect, but I mean, similar to what you're describing. Um, you know, I, I, at least for myself, have found that I'm a little quicker to uh, be irritable. And, uh, and it's not that I'm a bad guy. It's just in the moment I'm thinking about something else and then someone else interjects that and then, and then there, there'll be a reaction. And, uh, and, and so you had talked about cognitive reflex conditioning. Uh, and so maybe walk us through that because for people who are watching this, and I know many of you are, um, you know, this is actually something you can put to practice like this afternoon that can literally begin the process of changing your mental and emotional state. So why don't you just talk us through that, Rob? Sure. So, you know, the, this uh, concept, this approach is something that was developed by the Certified Coaches Federation and we teach in the level one course and it's a four step process. And, and I'll just very briefly describe it because it's, it's actually a very easy to use, but extremely powerful technique. And the first step is to, is to recognize what's happening. You know, what are you seeing, hearing, feeling? Um, you know, what do you, who else is around you and, and what are you experiencing? So just being aware, so that's the, the first step. The second step uh, is to realize what you actually want if it's different than what you're recognizing. 
Um, so to realize, okay, well, if I'm arguing, I realize I don't actually want to be arguing. Um, yeah. And to make that distinction of what you actually want, because in the heat of a moment, it's difficult sometimes to make that distinction. Yeah. But sometimes when a conversation ramps up, we start to feel like we're getting out of control with it. And we can actually say, well, this isn't the direction I want to go with this. I actually just wanted to share an opinion or to give a different thought on something. And, so, and then the third step is to replace, to say, you know, what are, what are the things that you want to replace in what you're doing? Is it the language? Is it your body language? Is it the timing of something? You know, that's something that um, I'm, a, I'm a highly communicative person. And I realize uh, over time that my wife is, is less so. Um, and so there are times that I'm ready to talk about something and she's not. And so uh, the need to time things is actually critical for our relationship. And I think it's probably critical for a lot of relationships. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the old sort of business type example would be, you know, an employee wants to ask a boss for a raise and without making an appointment, just sort of leans into the office and say, hey, hey, you know, knock, knock, knock. Hey, boss, I was just thinking, I was wondering if I could get a raise. <laughs> but, you know, it, it doesn't show a lot of, uh, awareness on the part of the employee to know that you know what's the state that the boss is in in that moment and are they going to be receptive to that um, and to try to time it better certainly not five minutes before lunch when the stomach's grumbling um, Absolutely. and then the last part is to repeat so repeat what works you know in terms of the behavior the language the everything uh, and then to uh, also to delete what isn't working so if it's an off the cuff conversation, you don't, you don't do that as you're trying to get the kids to bed because there's too much attention being paid to that. So trying to find the time and the, the right place and language and everything to, to make those things happen. No, and, and I mean, I, I just think that's such a great reminder because I know many of the people on the call today, um, you know, they've done the level one course and, and even if they haven't, I think it's a, a nice four step process, you know, so yeah. as Rod mentioned, I mean, both of us are, working with the Certified Coaches Federation. And, 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 and in that process, we're teaching coaches how to help their clients essentially get control of their mental and emotional state and, uh, and their behavior. And so this simple four-step process, I think, is so helpful. I mean, number one, you got to recognize, you got to be self-aware. Uh, you know, that means you have to be in the moment. You can't just be, you know, always thinking about what's coming or what's behind. You've got to recognize that number two, you got to realize like, what do, do I really want? Do I, you know, for me, do I really want to be irritable to this woman who I actually love and, mm -hmm. and, and have given my, my life to? Um, no, I don't. That's not what I want. I actually want to be seen as gentle and kind and, and caring and empathetic. And so I have to replace what I'm doing uh, with what I really want to be doing. And, uh, and then you got to repeat. And, and I think that the word repeat is so important because because that's what creates the new reflex, right? I mean, uh, and eventually, rather than reflexing, in my case, a little bit of irritability or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm then going to be reflecting kindness and, and patience, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, hey, uh, I wish I had it perfected. I, I don't. I'm, I'm a ways away from it. But at least I, I've got the tools. And so if, I, if I've got the tools, I can work at it. And uh, in time, build the kind of life that I, uh, I love. So, so Ron, I, I want to just pick your brain. I know we don't have a ton of time left, but you know, when it comes to business and I know, you know, you and I are uh, with uh, CCF and with healthy, wealthy and wise, like what are your thoughts right now about what, what people need to be doing? I mean, financial security is a big question. And when, and when you, when you think about it right now, at least in Canada, you know, in, in my view, we've, we've, we've put a, a $300 billion bullet in the chamber and, um, and I don't know in three months if we'll have an uh, ability to do that again. Maybe, maybe one more time. But Canada, we're not the U.S., we're not Germany. Um, you know, we, we just can't borrow our way out of this. And so for people who are thinking a lot, because I know many are, you know, what do I need to do to secure my finances? What do I need to do to kind of have financial freedom? Is, is that even an actual goal <laughs> anymore? Or are we just going to wait for, for the government to keep, you know, sending us money? You know, what are your thoughts about that? It's a, it's a great question. And it's, it's a big question. Um, because there's, there's so many aspects to it. I think that uh, going back to something I said earlier about, you know, we haven't had very many 
crisis situations to deal with as a country. Um, that's part of it too. We haven't had very many financial crisis situations happen either. Yeah. And uh, if you look at some of the, the latest uh, stats, I think I saw something that just came out today that uh, consumer debt is at an all time high, partly because of COVID-19, because people had to dip into, uh, I, if they had savings, they dipped into savings, but if they didn't, they dipped into credit. Yeah. And that, you know, increases risk. It's a little bit like, you know, driving down the highway and you want to get somewhere, happiness typically for most of us. And we just, we think, well, let me go faster. I'll put the pedal to the metal and I'll go from 100 to 120 to 140. Well, there's a tipping point at which if you go too fast, which is spending too much money that you don't have, uh, your risk goes way up. And I think for a lot of us, I think the, the risk is, you know, if our expected income is interrupted, how long could we last? And there's been, there's lots of numbers that are thrown around that, you know, it's a, it's a, a paycheck or two paychecks or a month away or, you know, 30 days away from bankruptcy for many people. Um, and I, I don't know what the, what the truth is for, for any one person, but those are, you know, some of the stats. I think anybody could actually do a quick calculation to figure that out. But to your question of, of what could we do, I think the, uh, the focus needs to be on how do I secure my, um, my finances? And I, I would look at it almost like a, a staged approach, which is before you can get to financial freedom, I would look at financial flexibility. And before you can get to financial flexibility, probably get to financial security. Um, because I think most people are actually in financial insecurity because you know, in a crisis, if they had to come up with a few thousand dollars because a relative was stranded somewhere and they had to, to buy a plane ticket or, you know, there was some some critical thing that wasn't covered by insurance, you know, or maybe you didn't have insurance because you couldn't afford it. So the roof, you know, something happened to your roof or something. Do you have, you know, say $5,000 um, to spend? And if people's credit cards and lines of credit and so on are maxed out, they don't. And so that financial insecurity, if people are there, I would say that no matter what stage you're at, I would look at how can I move towards or into the next stage. So financial insecurity to financial security to financial flexibility. And that financial flexibility is where I think a lot of people think they are now, which is that, well, I, I, can, I can buy what I want. I have a credit card with a five, ten, twenty thousand dollar $20,000 limit, but that's not your money, right? I mean, that's yeah. the bank's money you're borrowing. And yeah. the same thing actually with our mortgage, right? Yeah. You know, when you have a hundred thousand, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollar mortgage, yeah. that's the bank's house, you know, until you get that paid off. Yeah. Um, and so moving from one stage to the next to the point that you can get as close to, if not into financial freedom, where you're not uh, spending, you know, using credit, or if you are, you know that it's a better choice in the short term. So for example, if you know that you have the money in the bank and you could pay for something, whether it's a repair on your house or uh, a new car because your car is broken down or repair to your car, then it would be about, um, you know, I'm going to choose. And this actually happened to me 10 years ago when I, when I purchased a car that this was right after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis that uh, they were offering 0% financing. Right. And I thought about, well, they're offering to give me money and then to pay it off monthly. There was no interest charge. And so it made sense for me to do that. That's leveraging that situation, even though I could have paid for it at the time. So I think looking at moving along that those stages uh, would be the most important thing. And in the specifics of how to do that would be to, um, I'm going to boil it down to one thing. And, and I know you know this, uh, Abe, because you, you live this, which is create value. And if you, if whoever's listening to this, watching this, uh, can create value in the world, something that is needed and wanted, uh, and people will pay for, then you're you're gonna you're going to achieve financial security, financial uh, freedom, financial flexibility at some point. You just have to do enough of that and continue to do it. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of great ideas out there. A lot of the 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 folks that are maybe on this webinar have some great ideas, but they haven't done enough of those things, haven't put it out there enough to generate enough of that money to create that um, financial freedom. 
Yeah, so some great responses, Rod. I mean, you know, essentially, you know, take care of what you've got. Uh, don't yeah. uh, add more debt. Uh, leverage the financial system if you can and, and where you can um, and, and, and really look to add value. So let's just talk about that, you know, and there's a comment in the chat window and I, I couldn't agree with this more from Heather. Thanks for sharing that, that it's also key. She says to have folks put a new perspective on loss, uh, remove the stigma attached to bankruptcy and starting over uh, reframe success is knowing how to let go of what's not important and, holding on to what is. And I, th I think there's some value in that, right? I mean, sometimes um, a bit of a reset is important, but, um, but back to what you were saying, Rod, if, if, I'm, if I'm, a, I'm a coach or if I'm a, somebody who's sort of thinking about my future, uh, even if I'm not a coach, what, what can I do uh, to start creating value? What would some next steps be? Well, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a quick answer to that, but I'll give you sort of a, a little bit bigger answer, which is to to find, uh, and this is something that I teach in, uh, in uh, we touch on it in the level one with the, with the new version of the course, but I also teach in the level two course, the Certified Master Coach Practitioner, which is to find that uh, if we remember our, you know, I don't know what grade it would be, our high school math class with the Venn diagrams, you know, the two circles that overlap, that on the one hand, you have whatever you're most passionate about. And on the other hand, on the other circle, you have what people are interested and willing to spend money on. Mm -hmm. And if you can overlap those two things, that's what a person needs to build. And uh, the reason is that there are lots of things out there that can generate income, can generate revenue for, for a person or for a business. But if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to get up early or stay up late. You're not going to post videos about it on social media. You're not going to talk to somebody, you know, when things get back to normal in line at a Starbucks or something about it, it'll be a, a task or chore to, to talk about it, even though it might've seemed like a good business opportunity or, or option. So I, I would definitely recommend finding whatever you're most passionate about and figuring out um, of that, what are people out there willing to spend money on to, uh, to enjoy that with the value that you're creating. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why you and I are both, uh, coaches in the Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise coaching program because, you know, we're, you and I are, are similar in many, many ways. And I think a lot of the members of the program are as well, which is that we're very passionate about our own personal development and we're very passionate about helping others. And we're, we're passionate about creating financial freedom so that we can do good things. You know, there's charities that I enjoy supporting uh, and uh, different causes and things that I enjoy supporting. I can't do that if I don't have the money to, to do that with. So uh, I think that that's a, a critical piece is find your passion, find what people are willing to spend money on to enjoy that passion of yours and then get it out there. I mean, it's the one thing that I emphasize the most for anybody in any kind of business is if people don't know you exist, they can't hire you. Yeah. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there in all realms of business, coaches, speakers, authors, restaurateurs, gym owners, uh, you know, yoga studio owners, uh, mechanics and contractors and all kinds of different people who probably have incredible skill sets and would be amazing to work with, but they're not telling anybody that they exist. So figure that first piece out, the overlap of passion and, uh, and potential, and then uh, get the word out that you exist and keep getting the word out. I love that, you know, and, and I mean, new, new technology has, has never made that easier than it is today, right? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's, there's no question that, you know, we live in a time uh, that, you know, I, I think about, I mean, you and I are, I, I think, roughly the same age. And, you know, I think back to my childhood or teenage years and the, the sort of very first, you know, um, vestiges of the, of the internet, you know, with the dial-up modem where you had to make sure everyone was off the phone before you could actually get online and you'd hear all the squeaking, whirring, buzzing sounds of the modem trying to connect. I mean, at that time, we had no idea that we, we could actually do this. In fact, it was a science fiction thing to do video calling like this was science fiction. Yeah. And so uh, it's amazing the time that we live in and it's, it's, it's right there for us. There's so many of these tools and many of them are actually free to use now. Uh, other than the cost of internet access and things like that. But 
that they're they're right there for us to use and so it's it's the best time for us to do it it's right now i love it you know i remember when i was uh, 16 years old and it's it's kind of a funny story but uh I was volunteering with a church group at the time. I was living in Halifax, grew up in Toronto, um, you know, had this spiritual experience when I'm 16. I was, and went, moved to Halifax. And uh, as I was volunteering with this church group, they were actually doing this theatrical presentation downtown in what's called Halifax Square, which is sort of a public area. I ended up sitting on a park bench behind, beside a guy uh, who was a newspaper columnist, but I had no idea. To me, he was just watching this dramatic production and uh, I just decided to sit down and make conversation with this guy. And then at the end of the talk, he said, well, my name is such and such, and I'm with the Halifax Chronicle Herald. Would you mind if I share the story of our conversation tomorrow in my column? And uh, I, was, I, I thought he was lying. I, I thought it was a joke. And so I looked at him very politely and said, sure. And the next day, uh, sure enough, you know, he named me, talked about our conversation, and there it was. And and at the time, as a 16-year-old, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Thousands of people know my name. Like, it, and, and it was a, a big deal. Now, of course, two minutes later, they forgot it, you know, uh, probably, you know, because, uh, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. But at that time, you know, to, to even have your name mentioned in the newspaper in a mid-sized city like Halifax was, was a big deal. Now, you know, this video will be seen by thousands of people, and it will be watched by you know, for thousands of hours. And, 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 and I just don't think that people understand this, the extent to which things have changed. I mean, you and I, we live in a day where our message, you know, our voice and our expertise can get uh, to people on the other side of the planet for almost no cost. And, and so I think part of it, you know, is people shifting and saying, hey, you know, that, that could be me. Like, why couldn't it be you, right? I mean, there's, yeah. There's nothing holding us back except often us getting in our own way. So, so Rob, what, what kind of final couple of pieces of advice would you give to folks? You know, I mean, I know you're, you're, you know, you're a high level athlete for many years, high level business person, clearly you get it. So what would be some things that you'd want to share with the, the, the viewers as we uh, come to a close here? Yeah, I, I appreciate that because I, I think that um, there are a couple of things that I believe that, uh, that we can all embrace. And I, I want to preface it to say that just because I say it doesn't mean that anybody has to receive it. You, you may hear it because I'm saying it and you're watching this webinar, but we all have to make our own personal choices about everything in our lives. And, and that's actually one of the first pieces is to recognize that we are the ones that make decisions in our lives. There are influences sometimes that we may feel are out of our control, but usually those are temporary. And uh, the truth of it is that no matter who we are, no matter where we are, whether we live in a small community, a mid or large sized community in a developed country or a developing country, uh, no matter where we are, we are with ourselves. And so our own personal mental health, our happiness, our self-awareness is, is so critical because th that will serve us no matter where we are, no matter what job we're in, no matter what relationship we're in. So having that, that self-awareness to know what's going on inside of us, inside of our thoughts, inside of our heart, our beliefs, and uh, whether that's from a faith-based perspective or from a, a personal purpose and, and meaning of life perspective, to really be aware of, of who we are and who we want to become, knowing that you know, we can create that on a daily basis. It's not something that happens, you know, with a snap of a finger or something like that. It, but it, it's, in a sense, it's several snaps of the fingers, you know. It's, it's the decision today that will affect tomorrow and the decision tomorrow that will affect the next day and, and so on. So that self-awareness would be a, a, a key component. The other piece, which is a little bit difficult for most of us to, uh, to embrace, is the notion that the suffering that we experience, whether you call it suffering or struggle or challenge or whatever it may be, uh, is temporary. Uh, no matter how difficult things may be, uh, they won't continue to be that difficult. The only time that we are relieved of that um, is when we pass. And this is, the, this is one of the sad things that I have encountered, unfortunately, a few times in my life, and I think, Abe, with your experience with, uh, in mental health, 
um, you've experienced this too, which is uh, the point at which some people get to where they consider self-harm, consider taking their own life um, as a solution for whatever challenge they might face. And, you know, there is a saying that, you know, when you take your own life, you're not ending your pain, you're only passing it on to those that survive, whether it's your family or friends or community or, or whatever the case may be. And uh, I've worked with a few clients who have had those uh, suicidal or self-harm tendencies and had the good fortune of collaborating with their, in one case, a psychologist, in the other case, a psychiatrist. And as a coach, we can provide a, a type of support which complements those other types of support really well. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that whatever struggle you're going through, I'm speaking to whoever is, is listening to this, no matter what struggle you're going through, it will pass. And all you have to do is, is put one step in front of the next, whether that's a financial struggle, a relationship struggle, you know, something at home, something at work, whatever the case may be, uh, to just keep going because things will get better. Um, and also to know that, that the good things in life are temporary too. You know, the car that you love will eventually break down. The pet that you have will eventually pass away. You know, relationships sometimes dissolve and so on. And so to, to take advantage of the day, take advantage of this day, take advantage of every day, every hour, every moment that you have, because we don't know, you know, when things may be taken from us. And so it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity. Every moment is an opportunity to be our best and to show up for others um, in, in our lives. So, you know, that's, that's the, the key takeaway for me. And, and I learned that early on, you know, something that happened in my life. And, and it's, um, it's tough because sometimes in the darkest times, we, uh, we struggle to, you know, to find our way out of those. But the truth is that even that little flicker of light that you can shine from your own heart not only can light the way for you like a candle in the darkness but you might actually be shining the light in a way that somebody else sees it and you can help them too so yeah. i would uh i would say uh that you know take advantage of every moment that you have nothing's ever as bad as it might seem and um to make the best of everything that we have i think that's great uh, great advice rod thank you so much for sharing that and uh you know it's been a pleasure to hear uh you know um about you and, and hear what your, your thoughts are. And, and, you know, I think it is, it is great advice. I mean, Hey, you know, no matter what you're going through, uh, it's, it's not eternal. It's not everlasting. It's, it's temporary. And, uh, and that, that alone, you know, gives people a sense of hope. Right. And, uh, and without hope, uh, boy, you're not in a good place. So, so Ron, how can, uh, you know, for those who don't know you, uh, how can somebody stay in touch with you? How can they get a hold of you? How can they follow you? We, we, tell us about that. Well, the, the best way to get in touch with me, uh, depending on, on what type of contact people want to have, is through the Certified Coaches Federation website. So certifiedcoachesfederation.com. Uh, my email address is rod at certifiedcoachesfederation.com. So that would be the easiest way. Um, I can be found on Facebook and Instagram and so on uh, if people want to connect with me there uh, and LinkedIn. So I, you know, I invite anybody to connect with me. If you want to continue this conversation in some way, if there's any way that I can help, um, then I would encourage you to do that. I would say, you know, uh, to, to relay on something that Abe and I both believe in wholeheartedly, the, the Healthy, Wealth and Wise Coaching Program. Mm -hmm. Abe is a phenomenal coach. And so if, if, if you're thinking, if anybody watching this has been thinking about hiring a coach, then, you know, Abe is your guy because he's, uh, he's gonna be able to help you get from wherever you are to wherever you wanna be. Um, and the program that, that we both believe in allows us to do that. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Abe, and uh, really appreciate what you're doing for the community overall. Well, thank you, Rod, and, and I appreciate your kind words. And for sure, folks, reach out to, to Rod. And uh, you know, again, he's an amazing coach as well. And uh, you know, uh, the Certified Coaches Federation, I think we, uh, you know, we, we're, not, we're not perfect, but I think we've made this pivot quite nicely with respect to COVID and a shift to online. And so if you go to CertifiedCoachesFederation.com, you'll see that all of our training programs, there is online uh, versions of them for the vast majority of those. Uh, they're either uh, live in terms of having an actual facilitator or there's recording. And so please do take advantage of that because 
Without a doubt. I mean, COVID is an opportunity. And so thanks for that. And so I'm going to share just a couple of quick thoughts as we bring this to a conclusion. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of business resilience is something we've been looking at. And uh, without a doubt, um, you know, I, I think that there's three things we need to do to be business resilient. Uh, I think Rod uh, touched on all of these in one way or another today. The first is to you got to get shifted. I mean, the, the shift has to occur mentally, uh, even emotionally, that, that it's not going to be what it was. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. You know, I was on a webinar with a lady yesterday who, who handles all the wellness programs for a large company uh, here in Calgary. And, and she said, you know, things will never be the same, but, but the way it was, wasn't perfect anyways, right? So we've got to shift. I, the second thing is we've got to get story. And, and for me, what that means is, you know, COVID is not happening to you. COVID is happening for you. And, and you might think that that's semantics, uh, but, uh, you know, in every situation, you know, and, and one of the things I often say to clients, and I think, Rod, you would concur, is, is that, you know, pain is, is sort of mandatory, but misery is optional. <laughs> you, know? Absolutely. You, know, you know, hardship is a part of life and, and adversity. And, and here we are. We're all in the same boat. Uh, you know, sorry, we're all in the same storm though not necessarily in the same boat. And so we have to tell ourselves a story, uh, I think, of, 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 of positivity to get through this, right? It's not like I'm this victim here of COVID. It's that I'm, 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 I'm going to take the learning from all of this to build a better life, to build a better family, to build a stronger financial future. And, you know, I can't say enough about this last one, and that's get support. Uh, you know, you and I, we aren't designed for social distancing. I mean, it's, it's the worst thing you can do medically. And I'm happy to see a lot of folks have changed their language around physical distancing because, you know, as human beings, we're hardwired for connection with each other. And, and so I can't think of any place better to find that support, honestly, on the planet than the Health, Wealth, and Wise Coaching Program. So if you uh, have any interest in that, please do reach out to Rod, reach out to myself. We would love to hear from you. And uh, listen, there's no uh, hard sales pitch. If it's not a fit, not a fit. But uh, I think you might regret it if you don't have that conversation. So please do book a support call and, and, and see what you can do to pivot. And, uh, you know, I think uh, lots of positive comments here in the, uh, in the chat window, Rod. And so thank you so much. And, uh, you know, next week we have uh, a, 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 actually a CCF grad. Uh, she's also a, uh, she is, her name is Sage Arkand, and she is the founder and CEO of Inspired Iskwu Personal Development Coaching and Inspired Iskwu Design. And, uh, you know, I got to know Sage when she took the class with me and uh, I was so inspired by how entrepreneurial she is. And she's also a, a young indigenous woman who has a, a heart to give back to her community and to her people. And so I can promise you uh, next week, you're going to get a lot out of Sage. She's got quite a story to tell and uh, she's taken that story and she's used it to, uh, you know, to support others. And so, you know, Rod, I'll turn it over to you for any final words. And uh, please do register for the webinar next weekend. But what's your final thought, Rod? Yeah, I, I'm just so grateful. In fact, you posted something about this today uh, after your run. You know, the, the, the necessity for us to embrace gratitude. Mm. And uh, I'm just so grateful for, you know, everything that I have. I'm actually... I found it very helpful to embrace the challenges that I have as well, and to be grateful for those. And in this moment, I'm just, I'm grateful for you, Abe. I'm grateful for, you know, you putting this together and you inviting people from all different walks of life and backgrounds and experiences and sharing that because you're, what you've done is, is you've created this online community um, to, to attract people. And, and even though we may be physically distant, we can be, socially close and, and you've allowed us to do that. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Rod. And uh, for sure, folks, please do tune in, uh, reach out to Rod, reach out to myself, tune in next week. You can go to businessresilience.com. I know you're going to love hearing from Sage. She's got a story. She's also a mom uh, on top of all of that. And so that's going to help. And, you know, I always try to conclude just by saying, you know, we, we have a whole new definition, don't we, of, of essential workers now. And I think it's long overdue. 
And so, you know, to all of the frontline workers who are serving us, serving our communities, keeping us safe and healthy, honestly, uh, we want you to know we see you, we thank you, and uh, we honor you. We're grateful for your service. And, and that's from the folks who deliver the mail to the folks who work in Tim Hortons to the folks who are in the grocery stores and gas stations all the way to our nurses and our healthcare providers. And so thank you. And uh, thank you, Rod. And uh, folks, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Abe. Take care. Thanks, Rod. My pleasure, Abe. Thanks very much for having me. Great job. Okay. Take care.